Hi, my name is Sofia Otero and I'm here with El Placazo at San Anto. And today we're going to sit down and talk with Francisco Cortez, who just had his exhibit at Centro de Artes. So, yes, thank you. I'm Francisco Cortez. I'm a photographer here based out of San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I have been a photographer for about, let's see, 20 years now. Um, and my most recent exhibit is at Centro de Artes, which is part of a group exhibit through um, what's called NYFA. It was a cohort that, that began about four or five years ago um, of, like I said, or I mean, I've mentioned nothing but immigrant artists. And we've had one round or one exhibit before about two and a half years ago. And so this is the, the second one that we have. Um, not as smooth as we would like because of COVID specifically Omicron kind of doing its thing. And so uh, it is open to the public, although we haven't had a opening, official opening reception yet. And do you think y'all have, y'all will have one? Uh, we will sometime this month in February. I'm not great with dates, but um, I can let you know soon enough. Um, hopefully we do. Right, it is, a, it is a type of thing where sometimes we, we have things that are set up and then they have to be delayed or canceled. Um, but there is, there is a plan to have an official opening reception sometime in February. And how did you first get involved with Centro de Artes? Um, I didn't directly. It was through some of the leaders in the, the cohort. Uh, like I said, there's a, a cohort of immigrant artists. And so there was about four or five um, Luis... Barderas, Kim Bishop, Ricky Armendares, I might be forgetting a couple of people. And so they, they really did a very difficult thing, which is wrangle about 30 artists and try to get them to submit work on deadlines. And then they approached the city with, with, um, with the idea of having a, a group exhibit. Yeah, no, I went to the media preview. It was huge. It took oh, cool. me like I don't know, two hours, maybe two hours. Yeah. And even then, like I was like rushing at the end. Yeah, 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 um, um, yeah, and everybody's work is pretty different from each other. So there's a pretty big range of, of art up there, which makes it more impressive, but kind of harder to, to absorb. Mm -hmm. And not just different mediums, but styles as well. So there's a couple of photographers in there, but all, all of our, our, all our stuff is very different from each other. Um, you have massive sculptures, you have, you know, small scale paintings. Um, you have artists that have been practicing for, you know, some close to half a century, and you have some that are relatively new as well. So there's there's a little bit of everything there. Which is good because you have like artists who are like up and coming, who are featured with like established artists. In right. The area. Yeah. It must be good like PR, I'm sure. It is. It is. And for example, the 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 first exhibit that we had. I was able to kind of finesse that situation and I was able to get six pieces of art from my students because I'm a, a full-time teacher mm -hmm. and I also have a photography program. And so I was able to kind of tack those on to my photos. And now those kids can say, hey, I had work exhibited in Centro de Artes in you know, 2019 or 2018, whenever, whenever that was. So, I mean, it's 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 a pretty big, pretty pretty strong sense of community between everybody that's participated and everybody trying to help each other out. And um, part of what I did mention is that there is initially in the program there was a mentee mentorship um, kind of practice uh, going on. So it, it's kind of kind of woven into to everything that that we've shown. And you've also taught with San Anto, right? Like. These are yours. I did. <laughs> I did for um, two, two of the, the summer photo programs. Seven years ago, eight years ago, something like that. Um, yes, these are some of the examples from, I think, the maybe the last year. I'm not really sure. One, 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 one year it was all black and white, and then there's some of the color um, 
color images from a different year. So yeah, that was, that was pretty great. So it was very intense because it's a summer program, but I think it's really only three weeks at the most. So it's, it's a lot of theory and it's a lot of practice. And then it's also prepping for a show all within a, a very short uh, time span. Um, but it's great. You know, you see kids that, especially now, a lot, a lot of, well, not just kids, but everybody, you know, your, your photos live and die on your cell phone. So yeah. to then print something out on, on a larger scale, um, you see kids look at their own work and they're like, whoa, that's, that's pretty cool. Or, you know, they acknowledge that that's, that's art. You know, I did that. I made that. I, I, I created something. So, yeah, it was two, two great summers many moons ago. How many years ago was it? Seven and eight, I think. Yeah, about, it's been a while. Uh, but as I mentioned, I also have a, I run a youth photog photography program, mm -hmm. uh, which is called the Light Catchers Society, uh, which I have been doing, maybe not officially with that title, but I've, I've been doing that since I first started teaching, which was 13 years ago. Um, but very recently, last year, we've, um, we got nonprofit status. And so that's kind of starting to lead us in a different direction where uh, we can have a budget that's bigger than zero, you know, <laughs> if, if people yeah. are willing to donate. It just mm -hmm. makes it a little bit easier for um, people that want to donate to be able to donate. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, then that, that's a little bit different because that's, that's a year-long program. program. Yeah, like oh, I said, so, so now the cultural arts is, like I said, about three weeks. So it was like a crash course. So and photography. Was, yeah. Oh. And so what brought you into teaching or what made you want to start teaching? What brought me into teaching, I had always considered it when going to school. I went to, I was fortunate enough to, to go to university and I studied photojournalism. Oh, initially I studied print journalism, quickly found out that is not what I wanted to do um, because I was interested in writing beforehand. But as far as the, the two classes that I did take, it was very formulaic um, and didn't like that. 9-11, uh, since it's all showing my age, it's a, 9-11, 2001 happened, and that, that made journalism um, just get even messier at, at the same time on top of what I saw as boring at the time. Uh, so then I was like, well, I've always wanted to take a photography class, but I went to really bad schools and I didn't have access to that. So I'm like, I'm in college. I'm paying for this. Let me try it out. Actually, I didn't pay for it. I, I was lucky enough to get mostly scholarships, but I was like, yeah, I have access to it. Hmm. And um, yeah, I took a photography class and boom, that was... That was it. It was it was great, and these are the days of all film, you know, nothing digital. Um, so I had the benefit of coming into photography with learning um, how to print myself in a dark room, and you know, the the idea of an image popping up in front of you and kind of falling in love with that. Um, that was that was great, and that was intense. And I I pursued that, and I continue to do it. The only issue was. My, my idea was to then become a photojournalist, combat photographer. And once again, I'm showing my age. When I began college, uh, the internet wasn't really a big deal. By the time that I left college, it was full blown. So that meant that um, a lot of newspapers and magazines um, couldn't sustain themselves because everybody's getting information you know, online. Um, so that, that was a big wrench and things. And so I did do um, a little bit of photojournalism, um, combat photography. And at the same time, then I found out, oh, um, I'm a father. I can't, you know, keep on risking my life. Um, and so I had always entertained teaching, just never as a degree. And then that's uh, when I moved back from Austin to, to San Antonio, I uh, got my teaching certification and literally two weeks after I got it, I was in the classroom with like 30 Whoa, fifth graders. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, uh, that was, I feel bad for those kids. Oh, I'm, I'm sure this, this, Yeah. Well, you know, that first year of teaching anybody, whether you, you go through, uh, uh, you get a degree or an alternative certification, it's like, you're just trying to figure things out and mm -hmm. not burn the school down at the same time. Um, so I think about them often. <laughs> and they're all, they were fourth graders at the time. They're all in their twenties now. They're like, yeah, they're like 23, 24 now. Um, but yeah, even then I, I, I did a photography program with the kids and back then it was just point and shoot cameras and mm -hmm. it was meeting up only one time a month. Um, but from there, 
it kind of progressed and I also worked with the uh, Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center, um, taught a photography class there in the neighborhood for two years, done work here at San Antonio Cultural Arts, uh, San Antonio Youth Centers, and yeah, it wasn't until about five or six years that I was like, I'm going to do this a, a little bit with more intent with my students here at school, mm -hmm. and, and that's when the Light Catchers Society was created. So you said you went from journalism to like photojournalism. Mm -hmm. I guess what was the big difference to you? Like, I guess, like what what drew you to pho photojournalism? Uh, I it, there's even though even though for example in a university there's there's the photojournalism department and then there's the fine art photography department. Mm -hmm. um, with through photography and photojournalism, it's it's still an art form, mm -hmm. and and I I can express myself through that. Mm -hmm. Right, because art yeah, and and like I mentioned, I I, I loved writing, um, but in a creative writing type of way. And then, you know, the classes that I initially took, and that was my first impression that it was, um, you know, just basic newspaper stories that that are just factual. You know, they're just like this happened, da, 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 this you know, it was, it was a formula. Mm -hmm. I hadn't even gotten to those courses yet where it was more like human stories and feature writing, and that probably would have changed my mind. Um, but I didn't give it a chance, and luckily I didn't. You know, I took advantage of, the, like I said, having the access to, to photography and and doing that, and and that is actually part of the reason why I really um, have committed a lot of my time and energy to my photography students is because when I took that first photography class, I remember I was taking a class with people that had been doing photography since they were about ten years old. And so I really had to try really hard, and luckily I, I did it, and I was really good and better than some of the people that had been doing it for a while. But I remember um, how stressful that was and kind of how bitter <laughs> I was um, because, you know, it was a matter of, like, access. They went to different schools, you know, quote-unquote better schools, which really just means you live in a, 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 a neighborhood with more wealth, right? And so... Um, you know, I want to give those kids that 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 access as well, just because I've seen the way that it's helped me, um, yeah. not just career-wise, but just personally and and in a whole bunch of areas of my life. And mm -hmm. and it's it's can also be seen as like it's not just art, but as a healing tool as well. And you know, we know in a state, especially in a city like this, with the highest poverty rate in the country, mm -hmm. um, kids aren't aren't being uh, serviced, and they need to heal from a lot of the trauma that. <laughs> is being inflicted on them daily. Um, so yeah, that's well, that's, that's great. Like I remember, I think when I like I used to be like pre med, and then I switched to um, art history when I was in college. Hmm. And I remember like going in and like people who like were taking the class for fun like knew more than me because they like uh, studied it and like yeah. their parents like took them in places and stuff. And like it was like really challenging at first. I think to like go through like imposter syndrome. I guess that's what they yeah. call it. Where you're like, oh, like, do I just like not know this? Or it's like, no, it's like you could have known it. It's just that it wasn't there when you were growing up. So yeah, I think it's no. great that you're giving like a chance for people to find like a new passion and like start like making their own art. Yeah. And, like, even like you said, like it can be like on the phone and like, because now cameras. I, mean, I don't. I know nothing about cameras. I'll say that right now. Mm -hmm. But I mean, they seem pretty good. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, you can, so. you can do a lot. And, yeah. You know, and and. Uh, my my kids like they use um, digital SLRs and they're very old. They're like 12 years at this mm -hmm. point. Um, but as long as we shoot during the daytime, we're good. It's like <laughs> they don't have like the the ability to shoot shoot in low light like newer cameras um, do. But but yeah, it's about giving them the the tools to kind of deal with things and be more confident and be exposed to a lot more. Because you mentioned you know imposter syndrome and that was that was me. You know like I went to school in Austin and I hadn't ever been to Austin until I packed up my bags and like moved up there you know and that was a huge culture shock and I'm the first male in my family to go to college so that first year I was about to drop out and go back home luckily I had a, a friend that was like no you need to stick it out you know like it was definitely imposter sense you know I didn't know it was called that back then but that's what it was like my idea was like I'm like walking around this university it was like backpack you know and like all the men in my family either um, work construction or 
are involved in all types of things, right? And so that was that 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 space, that city, that environment was definitely, you know, foreign to me and I felt like I didn't belong, but I had the advantage of, of somebody being there to kind of basically talk me out of it and, you know, luckily they did and I can't imagine how different my life would be if I would have just called it quits after that one year. So you talk a lot about people taking ownership of their own stories and I was wondering if you could elaborate on that and like, and I was also wondering if maybe that served as some inspiration for your project at Cassiano? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, th I think maybe it's, it's more of taking, folks taking control of the, the narrative of where they live, like the way people talk about them. Um, you know, I have a background in, in journalism, be it for journalism, not, not news journalism, but in my experience living, you know, growing up, I lived mostly on the south side, but then also the west side and a little bit on the east side, is just seeing how the news talks about where you live, right? And aside from growing up and seeing that myself, you know, I live on the west side now and I have for, for a while. I work on the east side. And especially the east side, it's, it's just this thing where, one, if you aren't from the east side, you don't ever go into the east side. So there's no way that you're going to really know what it's like, right? So you just, your information is what the stories you hear are based off the news. And um, I'm not saying like fake news, but fear sells, mm -hmm. right? And um, just oversimplifying things makes it an easy story. And you go on to the next thing, you sell commercials. Um, but the reality is that not just neighborhoods, but also as individuals, especially uh, black and brown folks, um, we're, we're complex, you know, news stories like that really minimalize who we are and it dehumanizes us at the same time. When people start listening to your individual stories, um, it's the opposite, you become humanized and then, you know, maybe empathy or, you know, sympathy builds and you start making connections and, um, we start moving away from this very, in my opinion, very American idea of like being very dog eat dog or however you want to call it, very, very selfish, you know, mentality. And then communities start to connect. Um, but it is people taking over the way that people talk about themselves and, and just, just sharing who they are. People are, I'm, I'm, I'm more comfortable behind a camera than not, and I say that in the sense that I can be um, not the best in social situations, well, but, great. but <laughs> thank you, <laughs> but humans are, like, people are amazing, <laughs> you know, like, and when you, like, hear somebody's story, you know, and our stories are, are ever going and they don't end, um, you realize how amazing that person is, you know, and then you also realize things aren't about me you know, aren't necessarily just about me, mm -hmm. you know, and you understand people's struggles and you understand people's victories. And if, if there are losses, you understand why they're at that loss or why they're at that point in, in their life. And once again, it goes back to, to empathy and, and trying to build that for other people. Um, because uh, I've seen a lack thereof, you know, when, when it comes to the communities that I live in and myself or, you know, part whatever demographic that I come from, you know, and um, it's, it's not helping anybody. I'm not trying to change the world, but I'm just trying to also give people the confidence to share their stories because sometimes people themselves don't realize how amazing their story is. They're like, oh, I'm just like this, this kid from the South Side or this like immigrant or whatever. And then when you like sit down and share it, people are like, what, you know, like, or, you know, things make sense. It's like, oh, this is why you are the way you are and in a positive or negative way whatever right but you know it becomes you know we're we're the result of of our experiences and 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 our childhood and, and early years um so yeah it's 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 all those things it's all those things and people that wouldn't ever go into the west side you know getting them there through through the photos and through through the conversations that i had with folks and, and that's what it was, conversations. I have this background in photojournalism, but it was literally just walking around a couple of days during the week for several months, just going up to the folks and talking to them. And, you know, a lot of those conversations were recorded and it wasn't really an interview. The only questions that I really did want to get to were about their access to art, mm -hmm. being that the Castellano homes are, you know, saturated with these beautiful murals. Um, 
I, I was just curious to see, like, are you an artist? Mm -hmm. You know, have you had access to art? When? And the, the cool thing about that is that I realized, too, a lot of folks are artists, mm -hmm. you know, and or maybe they're, they were or maybe they're, they're artists and they don't even realize that themselves. Yeah. You know, I talked to this one couple and the man is very much an artist and an illustration and then he has his obstacles. He has severe ADD, which could be ADD. It could be, you know, a, a symptom of trauma. Those things are often misdiagnosed. And he just couldn't really work on his art unless, unfortunately, it was when he was locked up and he's tried to continue it when he's out. So then his, his partner, she starts sharing with me some of the things that she does. And I'm like, like, you're an artist. Mm -hmm. Like, she's like, no, no. I was like, yeah, you are. And like, I didn't say it, but I'm like, you're kind of more of an artist <laughs> than he is, to be honest, like with like your creativity and like the things you actually build and accomplish. Um, but that, that is actually something that, that surprised me, like how many people you know, do art. And that's one thing that I love about this city. Like, it shouldn't have surprised me because having lived in Austin, lived here, I compare the cities a lot and I love this city. And one of the reasons I love it is because the art here and the artists are, are genuine, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, we have folks that have formally studied art, but most artists that I know, it's because it was, they became an artist out of necessity, mm -hmm. right? As, as a way to like heal, um, even if nobody really guided them in that direction, you know, as opposed to other places where I feel like some artists just kind of wear that badge and that label and they want to be called an artist, you know, and yes, they're producing things, you know, they're being creative, but the place that it comes from in this city, I think is a lot more genuine. And I just have respect for any artist in the city. It doesn't matter what level, you know, that are at, um, you don't have to have, you know, art and shows, you know, you can just keep it on your shelf or keep it in your room yeah, exactly. or on, yeah, you know, I think like, um, the parameters for like an artist, I think are usually very like, narrow yeah like it's odd like it's like i think like you said like most people yeah i think are an artist in some way like that lady you mentioned like what does she do uh she she did woodworking she would just create oh, things yeah. out of wood That's yeah amazing. and then she was like yeah and i got like this dremel and i like create this yeah. and i even got this little like adapter on there because like i don't know she like hurt her hand but she like was able to like find something and like and these are people that also basically that couple you know didn't have a lot of means they're basically living on the street um, but they're both these artists, you know, and, and that's something that's taken me a while personally in the last couple of years, I realized how many artists there are because I had one, not never really a clear definition of what art was growing up or what an artist is. Um, and then I had that, that, that misconception of like opposite of what I said, it's like, you gotta have like a certain level of, of success to be an artist. Yeah. Um, and it's not it. And, and one, one moment that kind of like flipped that switch for me too was, um, I heard a, a shop teacher one time talking from, and I mentioned this to a lot of folks that I talked to in the neighborhood is he was, um, a shop teacher at Sam Houston. And he basically simply put, he's like, you know, um, he's like, if, if you create something that wasn't there, you know, like it's as simple as that, like you are, you are an artist, yeah. you know? And I was like, damn, like that's, that's so good. And it's so true. And it's like put in such, such a simple way. And I think also because I had this like perspective or this idea that he wasn't an artist cause he was like a shop teacher, mm -hmm. right? Not even shop teacher. I mean, like it was not like woodworking and I forgot exactly what, what he, he did there at the school, but he's like this big dude, burly dude and like not a typical artist. Right. Yeah. But it, like he was, you know, and you know, the heck with like whatever I think. Right. And which was wrong, you know, but he's like, right. And that's made me see things in a whole bunch of, uh, see, see it in a whole bunch of areas. You know, my father is, um, works con construction and he works, um, different types of construction jobs and, I realized like, and he builds things out of nothing. And I'm just like, damn, like that's his, that's, that's artist, his art. And that's yeah. how like he deals with things. Like he could have done other specific things that, that were, would have been manual labor, but he's chose to always stay in that. And he never said it like, and now like I'm, I'm 38 and like, I'm connecting the dots, you know? Um, because that was his, without maybe in him realizing it, that's his form of trying to deal with things. It's like making sure that he's, in a job where he's building and at the end of the day there's something there that wasn't there before and mm -hmm. there's like huge value in that that i realized now that i didn't realize as a kid also because i had to work with him a lot and didn't get paid so i was like it was better <laughs> right but um 
but yeah yeah it's it's something that that um I never nobody really had that this conversation with me you know and it took me a very long time to to kind of make sense of it um but now I see it and I see that we're all kind of dealing with things and we're all trying to figure it out and art is a good way to kind of help with that and is that one of the reasons you included like um sorry you included a lot of art the public art in the background of your pictures and um is that one of the reasons yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, at, at the Graciano Homes, I, I live very close to Graciano Homes. I'm about six blocks away. Um, and I don't, even though I'm six blocks away, the Graciano Homes is its own community, right? You have like these communities within communities. And I always just like growing up too, I'd be around there and just like thought it was amazing. It was beautiful. And then especially like now as I get older, it's like, it's not as simple as saying this, but it's like you, you, you drive down, um, what is it? Um, and, and you, you're basically in this like open space gallery, you know, like public art and you're there. And um, I could have been more purposeful in, in making sure that there was always a mural behind somebody, but it really, that was only part of it. And like I said, the part of it was people diving into themselves and sharing their stories. And how did you go about like, like talking to them, like, like approaching people in the street? Um, just, just literally walking around. Um, I use a very small, the approach that I took was also using a, a smaller camera that is not intimidating and just a small Fuji camera, one lens that's all used on there. And people, I think also people kind of, I was around there so much people saw that I'm just some guy with a camera, right? And just kind of approach him and be like, hey, you know, I'm working, just starting right away, like, can I take a picture? I'm working on this project, explain why. And then before even taking the picture, a lot of times they would just dive into this conversation and and just talk about whatever, you know, whatever people wanted to share. And walking around, you know, one thing you might notice is that that my a lot of the pieces that I have are very much the, the work is very male dominant. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm walking around just for like obvious, you know, sen reasons of sense of security. It's more guys outside than than not. Um, but in that in that approach, I got to realize like a lot of these men just want to talk mm -hmm. like we don't we don't a lot of times there was also just like very deep conversations that happened where i was like whoa like you just like unload it on me in a good way and i was there for it you know mm -hmm. and it was just something else that reminded me that you know we don't talk about things we don't seek help you know when it comes to like mental health or like therapy and mm -hmm. And, and that's the journey that I'm personally on. And I'm trying to like get more people to do it, you know, because I've lived in that, you know, this area where it's taboo to, to basically like show emotions, whatever. And, and it's, it's not good, you know, and, and people want to do something about it. They just kind of have fear of what other people might think, or they just don't have easy, easy access to like mental health. Um, and then also, you know, just sometimes following up with them, running into them again. What I also did is I had a, a small kind of Polaroid style printer mm -hmm. um, that then I, I print out a picture of one of the portraits I took of them and gave it to them. So they had something tangible to, to walk yes. away with, you know, like they're, they're giving me something, they're sharing something. Like I feel like I should at least give something back, even if it's, if it's a small picture. Cause I was going to ask if you ever like follow up with the picture. Like with your subjects. Like, hey, yeah, I run into like out. different people and there was one um one family who I hardly have any images in the show and in in the Centro Artist there's not a lot of captions for, for the images, but in, um when I first displayed it, I purposely didn't include on a lot of information there, but it was a family that I check in with because three days before the first time I met them, unfortunately, um the family had lost their mother to, to COVID. Um, and so that was, that was a huge moment where people want to talk. Like I just, you know, I didn't try to take a picture. I didn't record anything. And, you know, you, you just see the grief that some people go through and they just want to do something about it. So, um, that being said, th this is a project that I'm not done with. It's, it's a project that I plan to continue for a very long time. Um, eventually I do want to show some of the work there in the Casiano homes. I feel more comfortable sharing it like in, in Centro de Artes than in Casiano homes because I feel like I try to respect 
you know, what people have, have shared with me and making themselves vulnerable to a certain extent. And so I really want to build up the project till it gets to a, a level that I feel comfortable is good enough to where I'm going to share it with, with the community. Because a lot of the images too is, um, it's not just taking an image and it's not taking like a sad image and there's really not a lot of sad images in there. And a lot of it is, is photographing people in a way that, that kind of empowers them too at the same time. Um, yeah, it's not so much the images of some people say, um, like take people pictures of like homeless people and like you're speaking on, I, I don't know, something about humanity or, and it's like, that's, that's not it at all. Yeah. You know, like I said, it tied, the, the way the images are taken tied directly into the idea of helping these people tell their story in a way that is not lies and they're not omitting anything negative, but in a way that kind of builds them up. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I want to keep on doing that and build up the project overall and then share it with them somehow. I was, yeah, I was going to say, um, like, look, when I looked at your photos, I think like a lot of the photos I wouldn't describe as very like, like sad, like you said. Yeah. Like I would like more like powerful, I guess. Like it was very much like, like, I don't know, like the, the person in, in it, like was like in control of the photo, if that makes yeah. sense. Like you took the photo and like, great yeah. job. Uh -huh. <laughs> but like, it was very much like, like, I think I could tell, like, there was, like, a sense of agency. Like, yeah. it wasn't just, like, again, like, go take pictures of people who were, like, maybe, like, in a tough situation. Yeah. It was more, like, these people, like, have lives and, like, yeah. like solid people who, like, yeah. have, like, a legacy and, like, agency and, like, respect. For sure. I think that yeah. was really incredible. Human condition. That was a term that I was trying to think of earlier. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, there's maybe only one image in there that is, is a bit somber and... Um, that that the the individual in the uh picture you know he just i don't know like he just was had a lot of he was carrying a lot of stuff right and like i couldn't even get him to to look at the camera for like a split second um and so that's the image that i ended up with no matter what and i mean it really just shows you know what happens to some folks when we go through things and especially some of the older folks that that we have that we tend to kind of forget about. And, and on the opposite end of that, his son is also in one of the other images and he's the opposite of that. He's just like super confident, you know, and, and very proud of himself. Or even in, in the conversation that we had, he's like, yeah, I'm like, I'm really confident about myself. I'm good at everything I do, including like this, 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 you know. Um, same family, different lives, right? And you, you see that come out in, in the picture. And are they, are they hung up next to each other? Because I don't remember seeing them. Uh, they are not. They were in the initial exhibit, mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately didn't have a lot of uh, control in the way that the, the images were exhibited at Centro de Artes. Mm -hmm. And there was also like an interview component, right? That was supposed to right. be Right, yeah, so there's an audio component that's supposed to be playing, um, which is kind of uh, snippets of the different conversations that I was able to record with, with folks. Um, and it's just kind of playing in the background. Um, and it really adds to it because once again, there's the visual part, you know, there's like the written part, and then there's, you know, actually hearing people, you know, going back into like humanizing um, the folks in, in, in the neighborhood. And not just like reading words, but like hearing, you know, their, the way they express themselves and the way they talk in these conversations. And you mentioned you had exhibited this before, right? It was like I in did. September, I think? I did in September. <laughs> um, in September as part of Foro September. Mm -hmm. um, so it was in the Jumpstart Theater. And um, that I had a lot more control of what I did. And I was, it was a much smaller space. Um, we made it work with kind of like movable walls. Um, it was only, it was a solo show. So as far as the audio, I wasn't, just only to play, be able to play it, but I could play it at a much you know higher oh, okay. level. Um, so yeah, then that's that's basically a lot of the same work from that project as what's exhibited at Centro de Artes. Awesome, and that's it's up the whole year. No, Centro de Artes. It's up to like June, June. or July. It's up for a good good oh, amount yeah. of time. Awesome. Yeah, so check it out, <laughs> people. <laughs> Um, I guess my last question is like about your website. It's like so it's F A photography. Uh -huh. I'm like that's a pun, right? It's kind of a pun. You, you 
touched on that earlier and I was like, oh, it's just like your yeah, F for Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, and then I kind of like spaced out and thought, but it was also because not to get into it too much, but then there's like, there's FA and it was a play off of like M.A., like La M.A. And there's ties that were there before. And so I was like, oh, this is perfect. And that's so funny because I completely forgot about that. And it's like a whole nother, yeah. <laughs> so a whole nother time. Um, but yeah, so the website is fafphotography.com. Um, don't update it as much as I should, which is like, I think what every artist does mm -hmm. or doesn't do yeah. um so also i've started to build up again um images on instagram so that is francisco cortez 210 cortez with an s um and that's more of a it's more more of the stuff that's that's very similar to what i've exhibited and just things that i find personal interest in um, sometimes websites well for me because i've done all types of photography work can also be kind of business focused um, but that Instagram account, which is, seems kind of silly to me because I'm like, oh, social media, but it's, it's a thing. It's a powerful thing, right? Exactly. A very accessible thing. Yeah. Um, that's where I, I actually put more of the stuff that, that actually, that, you know, matters to me, you know, more, more than not. Awesome. Well, you heard it here first. Instagram. <laughs> Instagram. You know, the gram. Yeah. I'm not on TikTok. I'm not on Snapchat or anything not like yet. that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. I'm trying to avoid it. That's honestly like good call. Like I, yeah. like I go check TikTok for like maybe ten minutes, and it's been like an hour. Like it's. Oh. I don't recommend. Yeah, that. it's like algorithms. They yeah. like get you. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming in and like talking. Yeah. To us, thank you. So. This is uh, it was really nice. Yeah, it felt. It's been good. It wasn't too intimidating. It's a, it's a conversation. Yeah. And uh, I appreciate those. No, yeah, well, no. Thank so, you. Thank you. And thank you for letting me share, a little bit about myself. You know, sometimes we see images and there's not really a lot of background information and sometimes that background information makes you see images in a different way. So yeah. thank you for, for letting me put that out there. Thanks for tuning in to El Placazo at San Antonio Cultural Arts. And if y'all like to go check out the NYFA Immigrant Artist Mentoring Program, the exhibition will be up until July 3rd. And thank you again to Francisco Cortez for coming in to talk to us. You can find his Instagram handle at FranciscoCortez210. And don't forget to check out the Light Catcher Society if you know anyone who might be interested.